This is the final space probe to ever land on the planet Venus. It's actually the last one in a long line of attempts made by the Soviet Union to explore the most dangerous place in our solar system. This is what the Soviets found when they landed on Venus and why they never went back. The real mystery of Venus is how it can be so fundamentally similar to the Earth and yet so catastrophically different. While Mars tends to get all of the attention right now in the 21st century, back in the early days of the space race, there was actually much more interest in studying Venus. And that's mostly because we can easily observe the surface of Mars through high-powered telescopes on Earth. So we already had a pretty good idea that there wasn't a whole lot going on over there. But Venus, on the other hand, has always managed to hide its secrets. All that we can see from Earth is an impenetrable cover of thick clouds. Those clouds might obstruct our view, but they also tell us something very important. It means that the planet must have a dense atmosphere, much more similar to Earth than Mars. And since Venus is even closer to the Sun than Earth, it must be warm down there, which at the time captivated the imagination of those of us on Earth. Our closest relative could be a lush tropical rainforest brimming with alien insects and reptiles. Now, even in 1960, that was still just a theory. More plausible than life on Mars, but still not widely regarded by the scientific community of the day. The famous astronomer Carl Sagan had already popularized the notion that the unbreaking cloud cover of Venus was more likely to be the result of a greenhouse effect that had gone wildly out of control and superheated the planet, meaning that the world below the clouds would be nothing more than a scorched hellscape. But there was only one way to find out. As with all of the early milestones in the space race, the Soviet Union was the first to make an attempt to study Venus up close. The year was 1961, and the Soviets had already taken a dominating lead over the United States by sending the first satellite into orbit with Sputnik. Then they launched the first person into space with Yuri Gagarin. They'd even been the first to send a probe to the moon with Luna 2. And since Venus is the next closest object beyond the moon, sending a probe there as well would have been an obvious next step. At the time, these early space missions weren't as much about the science and discovery as they were about being the first to achieve a historic milestone. If we learn some interesting stuff about space along the way, that's great, but propaganda and political gains reigned supreme in the Cold War era. With their aim set clearly on adding Venus to a growing list of accomplishments, the Soviets built two probes, Venera 1 and Venera 2. This was a common procedure in the first decades of space exploration to launch missions in pairs because there was still a very high likelihood that one of them was going to fail. You have to appreciate the ambition of these primitive interplanetary flights. With nothing more than a calculator to guide them, the Russian engineer strapped a rocket engine to their probe, loaded it on top of a ballistic missile called the R-7, and set course for Venus. Then they let it rip and hoped for the best. The good news is that both probes were able to fly within 100,000 kilometers of Venus. The bad news is that both probes experienced a full system failure before reaching their destination and therefore no usable data was returned. While the Soviets went back to the drawing board, NASA pressed on with their own Venus mission. In 1962, the Americans succeeded where the Soviets had failed. NASA's Mariner 2 probe flew within 35,000 kilometers of Venus and completed the first close-up observation of another planet. During a 42-minute scan of Venus, Mariner 2 gathered significant data on the Venetian atmosphere. What they found was troubling. The data confirmed Sagan's theory about the greenhouse effect, with temperatures measured up to 459 degrees Fahrenheit or 237 degrees Celsius, which is double the boiling point of water. And that's just what they could measure from orbit. Mariner 2 also found that there was an incredibly tall cloud layer that extended 80 kilometers above the surface, which on Earth would be the equivalent of clouds stretching all the way from the ground to the edge of space. And those clouds were still able to keep the surface of Venus shrouded in mystery, but it was safe to say that there couldn't possibly be anything alive down there. Based on this data, NASA largely decided to pass on further exploration of Venus in the short term, considering it an environment totally inhospitable for either man or machine. They switched focus to the Moon and Mars. 
The Soviets were less convinced. They felt like they were on the cusp of a monumental discovery, and with the US bowing out, it was theirs for the taking. They refocused their efforts to prepare for the second wave of Venera probes, but they had no idea just how bad things were about to get. Artificial intelligence isn't just changing the way we work, it's changing the way we think. The same kind of revolutionary technology that took us to orbit, mapped the stars, and built rockets that land themselves is now transforming every field on Earth. The question is, are you learning how to use it? That's why I've partnered with Outskill, who are hosting a free two-day live AI mastermind training this weekend. It's a hands-on experience where you'll learn directly from experts at Microsoft, OpenAI, NVIDIA, and Google, people who've helped build the foundations of the AI era. In just 16 hours, you'll explore over 10 AI tools, learn how to build AI-powered workflows, and even create your own AI agents. Normally, this program costs nearly $400, but right now, Outskill is offering free seats for the first 1,000 people to sign up. And if you attend both days, you'll unlock over $5,000 in exclusive bonuses from a comprehensive prompt Bible to a roadmap for monetizing AI and your own personalized AI toolkit. If you're fascinated by the technology shaping our future, this is your chance to not just watch history unfold, but to take part in it. So grab your seat now using the link in the description and step into the next great leap in human innovation, AI. The year is 1966, and we are already looking at an entirely different space race. The Americans have caught up, and landing people on the moon has become the top priority for both nations. But that doesn't mean the Soviets have forgotten about Venus. They've actually spent these four years building a bigger and tougher spacecraft for Venera 3 and 4. It's now weighing in at over 900 kilograms, up from about 650 on the previous generation. These new probes are equipped with a variety of instruments like a barometer, a radar altimeter, gas analyzers, thermometers, and a detachable pod that would serve as a descent module. The idea was that the descent module would parachute down through the Venetian atmosphere and take readings about the composition, temperature, and pressure all the way down to the surface. In reality, things got a little complicated. Venera 3 experienced another system failure along the way, but the Soviets' aim was true, so the probe still managed to hit Venus like a cannonball. This became the first man-made object to ever crash into another planet. The USSR actually scored a hat trick on impacting near-Earth bodies. They were the first to crash land on the Moon, Venus, and Mars. There's a lesson in there probably, if you're gonna fail, do it historically. Anyways, Venera 4 in 1967 was the closest yet to a success story. The probe made it all the way to Venus with all systems go and dropped the capsule down into the Venetian atmosphere. From here, the descent module deployed its parachutes and drifted slowly down towards the surface. This was the first spacecraft to ever collect measurements inside the atmosphere of another planet. Data returned by the probe showed something very interesting. At high altitudes, the atmosphere of Venus is very similar to Earth on a warm summer day, a perfectly hospitable environment. But the lower the probe gets, the more extreme the climate becomes, not only ramping up in temperature, but in atmospheric pressure as well. Much like diving deep into the ocean, which is a strange concept to wrap your head around, the air is not only thick, but it's really heavy as well. It gets so bad that after 90 minutes of slow descent, transmission from the probe goes dead. It's widely believed that the capsule was simply crushed like a beer can by the weight of the planet's atmosphere. With this new information, the Soviets were nearly certain that their remaining Venera 5 and 6 probes of the same design would have no chance of reaching the surface intact. But they launched them anyway, with back-to-back -back missions in January 1969. At this point in the decade, the Americans had already flown a crew into orbit around the moon and were preparing to take the first steps on the lunar surface. The Soviets knew they weren't going to be able to match that, but maybe if this Venus exploration works out and they can discover something amazing on the surface, then they might still have an achievement that keeps them competitive in the space race. But success would not come easy. Both Venera probes recorded less than an hour of data each before meeting the same crushing fate as their predecessor. And yet the Soviet Union was not discouraged in their efforts. They would simply build even bigger and even stronger probes and they would try again. 
For their next round of Venera landing attempts, number 7 and 8, the Soviets made two key modifications to the probe design. For one, the descent module was now built with a thicker outer shell of steel to resist the atmospheric pressure. And two, the inside of the probe was reinforced with an internal sphere of titanium to protect instruments from the heat and additional padding around the sphere to soften the blow from impact. Which was a smart choice, because when Venera 7's parachute deployed on August 17th, 1970, it didn't last very long. The material somehow got ripped or it just straight up melted, but either way, the landing module ended up dropping like a rock, reaching a terminal velocity of 61 kilometers per hour before bouncing off the Venetian surface. Based on that transmission, the observers back on Earth assumed that they were looking at yet another failure to reach the surface alive, but this was not the case. Even with a busted up antenna, the lander was sending back information, and what Venera 7 found would confirm scientists' worst fears. The temperature recorded at the surface showed 475 degrees Celsius, or roughly 900 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the same as the inside of a wood-fired pizza oven, and far too hot for any machine to operate reliably. And yet the Soviets were undeterred. At this point, what did they have to lose? The Americans had already planted their flag on the moon. That race was won. But the Soviets were still left with other opportunities to make their mark on history. They could be the first to make game-changing discoveries on Venus about the origins of life and the universe. They could even be the first to land on Mars. This is the direction the Soviet Union would pivot with their space program in the 1970s. Interplanetary Exploration. In 1971, they launched a probe that would achieve the first ever soft touchdown on the surface of Mars. The lander only operated for about 20 seconds before going completely dead, but it was still a major accomplishment. Then, in 1972, they would return to Venus yet again with Venera 8. Miraculously, this probe would not face any technical difficulties along the way. The descent module parachuted down softly onto the planet's surface with all of its instruments intact and recorded data for nearly one hour. So by now we know that in addition to the extreme temperature, the air pressure on the surface of Venus is the equivalent of 92 times the atmosphere on Earth, which is the same as being one kilometer underwater. And if that wasn't enough, the lower atmosphere is filled with sulfuric acid. That's the stuff inside a car battery. Now, you would think all of this confirmed knowledge would finally deter even the most die-hard engineers, but the Soviet Union just didn't believe in quitting, not when they were this close to cementing their legacy as the first interplanetary explorers. So they aimed their sights right back at Venus, because Venera 8 revealed one last fact that was just too good to pass up. Even with the dense cloud cover, there was still enough sunlight reaching the surface of Venus to take a photograph. And if successful, that could be the first ever picture taken on another planet. For Venera 9, the Soviets made a fundamental change to the probe's design, and you can tell there's something different just by looking at it. The descent capsule itself has of course been beefed up yet again. We are now tipping the scales at nearly 5 metric tons, or around the weight of a fully grown African elephant. But the standout features have to do with a new landing procedure. Given everything that they now know about Venus, the Soviets want to keep their probe's exposure to the environment as minimal as possible, and they also learned that even after being dropped accidentally and plummeting hundreds of meters, Venera 7 still managed to function. So what happens if we just drop the probe intentionally? And this is what's going on with those two rings. At the bottom is actually the landing gear or impact ring, just a flat metal circle connected to the main body by a series of shock absorber legs. And at the top is the new aero brake. It's how they land on Venus with no parachute required. This thing that looks like a weird hat is all you really need to get the speed of the probe down low enough for a safe landing. That is putting the incredibly thick atmosphere of Venus to work, because it actually behaves more like water than it does like any air you've ever experienced. But what about those cameras? Well, this is the first photograph ever taken of Venus. It was captured on black and white film by Venera 9 in 1975. What we are looking at is a field of broken, jagged rocks surrounded by a sand-like material. It's not exactly breathtaking. The photo is only interesting because it was taken on Venus, but still, 
very cool. And this is the view from Venera 10, an identical lander that arrived just a few days later. Now we are seeing flat ground with hardly any of those chunks of rock, just the smooth top of what was probably once an ancient lava flow. Venera 11 and 12 were less eventful missions. They failed to return any interesting photographs due to lens cap failures. This was one of the tricks with Venus. You have to protect the camera on the way down, or it will melt prematurely, but then you have to rely on an automated system to reveal the lens. And it didn't always work. But then we get to Venera 13, an unlucky number, but a highly successful mission in the year 1981. This probe returned the first ever color photo of the Venetian surface. Again, the surface around the lander is just flat, sandy rock, but you can see just a touch of landscape beyond. The probe touched down near the edge of a cliff, so you can get a sense of depth that makes it all seem a lot more real and more alien at the same time. Anyway, you can also see the base of the lander again here, and you're probably wondering, what is the deal with those teeth? They look almost purposefully brutalist, but the teeth served an aerodynamic function. Metal fins were added to the outside of the impact ring in an effort to stop the probe from spinning and shaking as it fell, which could lead to rough landings. But that's not all the Venera 13 could do. The probe was also equipped with a drill and surface sampler to analyze the Venetian soil. What it found was a material very similar to a rock that we call tough on Earth. It's essentially just solidified volcanic ash. Oh, and one more thing, Venera 13 carried a microphone. So we can listen to the sounds of Venus. It's essentially just wind noise and the sound of the probe doing its thing, but again, like the photos, there's something very strange and alien about it. Venera 14 was again pretty near identical. It found another flat plane of these smooth rocks, which were determined to be very similar to thaletic basalt, which is a volcanic rock that makes up most of the Earth's ocean floor. And that was it. That's the last time that a man-made object reached the surface of Venus, and along with it comes the last photograph ever taken of the surface. But what I want to dwell on here is why we never went back. One very obvious reason would be that it's a lot of work and a lot of expense for relatively little payoff. You can send a robot to Mars and it'll last for years. The longest a Venera lander ever survived was about two hours. The Venera program came to an end right as the Soviet Union itself was coming to an end. Leadership and priorities changed. Russia went through a tough time in the 1990s. Meanwhile, NASA has just been too sensible to try and reach the surface of Venus. Trying to justify that cost to politicians when you get so little in return is not an argument scientists would easily win. So for now, the surface of Venus remains one of the solar system's greatest mysteries. So close, yet so far away.